Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, nearly four million members are banded together to build better futures for themselves and their families. Their reasons for becoming Equitable Society policyholders are many, but certainly among the most unselfish and far-sighted Equitable Society members are those parents who have seen the wisdom of an Equitable Education Fund. Fathers and mothers, in just 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will tell you how to make sure that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have through an Equitable Education Fund. Tonight's FBI file, The Phantom Mine. Many of us know the type of person who would be willing to pay more for an article in the black market than he would be willing to pay for the same article if he were able to buy it legitimately across the counter. That type of person is always looking for an angle, for a connection through whom he may be able for a little while longer to put off the ignominy of going to work. There is nothing such a person detests more than the idea and the practice of a day's wage for a day's work. Those people are known as operators, and even when they continue for years to be small operators, they never lose hope that one day, through some miracle, they will become Mr. Big Shot. In their eyes, a big shot is anyone who does not have to work for a living, but who makes his money through lying, cheating, or killing. There are those who have pictured this swindler as a criminal in kid gloves, who wanted only money, and who abhorred the type of criminal operation in which lives are lost. Such a picture is a sentimental caricature, because the truth is that to the criminal, whatever his type of crime may be, no one's life is important except his own. Tonight's file opens aboard an old freighter which is tied up to a dock along the waterfront of a large eastern city. It is early afternoon. A bright sun is shining, but below decks on this rusting tramp, dampness and gloom prevail. Sheltered by this atmosphere, a man moves silently, stealthily along a grimy corridor. Then... Looking furtively about, he enters the engine room and moves swiftly to one of the engines. He stands examining it intently, unmindful of the quiet approach of footsteps. What are you doing? Huh? I asked you what you were doing. Well, I, I, I was... Who uh, are you? One of the wipers. I'm the engineer of the ship. I've never seen you. Well, I just signed on, sir. What's your name? Louis Jackson, sir. What were you trying to do to that engine? Oh, nothing, sir. 
Look, may I go now, sir? What's that in your hand? Uh, just a brush, sir. Let me see it. What for? I smell kerosene. I think it comes from that brush. Well, let me see it. No. Then there is kerosene on it. So what if there is? Come on. I'm taking you to the captain. Okay. Good afternoon, Captain. Good afternoon, Mr. Metcalf. Captain, I hate to trouble you, but I've got to report this man. Uh, weren't you just signed on? Yes, sir. Now, what's your report, Mr. Metcalf? Well, I was down in the engine room a while ago. And this man came sneaking in. He didn't see me. He went over to one of the engines. Started to fool with it when I called out to him. Yes? He refused to tell me why he was there. Then I discovered he had a brush in his hand. The brush was soaked with kerosene. I see. I haven't looked at my engines yet, Captain. I don't know whether they're damaged or not. Well, let me know as soon as you inspect them. Yes, sir. Now, do you wish to press charges against him? That's up to you, sir. Well, I'll question him. You go examine the engines. Leave the man here with me. Yes, sir. And thanks for being that alert, Mr. Metcalf. You're welcome, sir. Well? Well, what? That was pretty stupid, don't you think? Letting him nail me, you mean? Yes. From now on, Louis, keep away from that engine room till we get to sea. Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is approaching the desk of Agent Tom Allen. Hello, Tom. Oh, hello, Jim. I thought you were in court today testifying in that Dexter case. There wasn't any need for me to testify. Dexter changed his plea to guilty. Oh, glad that file's closed. Yeah, so am I. But it looks as if we've got one to work on now that's going to be just as tough. New one? That's right. Just came in as I got back from court. The SAC assigned it to us. Well, what's the story? Seems a man named Rafael Fernando went to the United States Consul in Barcelona, Spain. He confessed that he'd been an accomplice in a fraudulent bankruptcy. In Barcelona? No, in Chicago. Well, the consul took Fernando's story and sent it back to the State Department in Washington. They, in turn, sent it over to the Bureau. Well, how does it get to this office? Well, it was sent to the Chicago field office first, and they conducted an investigation on it. Well, how long ago did this bankruptcy take place? Fourteen months ago. In Chicago? That's right. Well, it's probably given everybody connected with it a pretty good chance to scatter. That's what the Chicago investigation showed. You see, the bankruptcy originally took place when Fernando, a partner in the firm... Allegedly absconded with $250,000 and then fled to Spain. Have you read the Fernando confession? Yes, it's here in the file. I just finished reading it. Does Fernando explain why he waited 14 months before he finally decided to confess? Yes. His partner in bankruptcy was a man named William Gilbert. Uh -huh. Fernando says that all he ever got out of it was transportation back to his home in Barcelona. I see. He says that Gilbert promised to send him $50,000, but that he never sent him anything at all. So this man Gilbert took all the money while Fernando took the blame. That's it. That still doesn't explain how we happen to wind up with the case in this office. Oh, the uh, Chicago office started to search for Gilbert. They learned that he'd changed his name and was headed for here. They didn't find out whether he intended to set himself up in business here, did they, Jim? No. According to everything they could find out, he was headed here to buy a Liberty ship. Well. Chicago also said that Gilbert had not only changed his name, but that he was very adept at changing his appearance. Mm. This makes the Dexter case look like high school stuff. Yeah, it's not going to be easy, I'll give you that. Well, let's go to work and see what we can find. Come in. Hello, Captain. Oh, hello, Mr. Grant. How does everything look? Yeah, your ship is in tip-top shape, Mr. Grant. You ready to sail tomorrow night? Yes, sir. When do you expect to do the job? Oh, when we're a few miles offshore... You've made all preparations. Uh, Louis put a charge of powder under one of the floorboards in the engine room. It'll blow a hole in the side of this ship big enough to walk through. Splendid. And just to make sure, after we sail, I'll have him paint the floor down there with kerosene. And you've got your story straight. Sure. After she sinks, I say we ran into a floating mine. That'll stand up. And take every precaution, Captain. Those insurance companies investigate every angle in a case like this. What do you collect from them, Mr. Grant? One hundred and seventy-five thousand. And the boat stood you a hundred and twenty thousand? That's right. 
Sounds like we're going to make a good night's pay. Tom, you want to walk with me down to the teletype room? Are you expecting something, Jim? Mm-hmm. Come on. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. The SAC spoke to the Chicago office a little while ago. They said they'd have something for us on the Gilbert bankruptcy. They say what it was? No, no, they didn't. They did say they had located Gilbert's ex-girlfriend, though. She was coming into the office there to answer some questions for them. I hope she can give us more of a lead than we've been able to get so far. Mm-hmm. I checked every hotel in town today. Nobody answering the description Chicago gave us on Gilbert has checked in recently. Oh, he's been in town. I found out that much. How? Oh. Well, you know that list of offices I got from the U.S. Maritime Commission? Oh, you mean that list that came in yesterday afternoon? That's the one. Well, I called the men who have been conducting the sales. I found that they remembered a man of that description bidding on Liberty ships here six weeks ago. Well, did he buy one? No, no, he didn't. That's too bad. That would have been an easy way to trace him. Uh-huh. Then three days after he left here, he tried to buy one in Boston, but he didn't have enough money to get one there either. Well, they've, uh, they've got those sales someplace about every week, haven't they, Jim? Uh, just about. Go ahead. I checked every one of them. He attended every sale there was up to about two weeks ago. Did he buy a ship at that one? No. Now, all of a sudden, he stopped showing up. I wonder why. Well, maybe he found a ship someplace, huh? Why do you suppose he's so anxious to get a ship? I don't know, Chuck. Nothing in his background that would indicate he was interested in smuggling. No. Well, there's your message now, Chuck. Mm-hmm. Hey, Tom, this might be the break we're waiting for. What is it? Gilbert's ex-girl says that he's living here now under the name of Harry Grant. Captain? Hello, Mr. Metcalf. You know I shouldn't bother you this late, Captain, but this could wait. Yes, what is it? Well, you remember the episode with the wiper yesterday? Yes. I have something further to report. On him? Yes. I just couldn't help this, Captain. I've harbored a suspicion against him ever since I caught him in the engine room. So? I kept thinking about it all day today. And a couple of minutes ago, I went to his locker. You did what? I went to his locker and I opened it. Well? I found some black powder and some fuses. Explosives? That's right, Cam. What in the world In would... my opinion, Captain, it can indicate only one thing. He aims to sabotage the ship. Yes. It certainly appears that way, doesn't it? Have you any idea where the man is now? No, sir, I haven't. But we can certainly... Captain, find... everything's... Oh. oh, excuse me, sir. Well, Captain... Will you question him, or shall I? Look, I've got to see you alone, sir. We have something important to discuss with you, Jackson. I'll handle him, Mr. Metcalf. You go back to your quarters. But you need the evidence against him, Captain. I took it from his locker. I have it right here. Captain, you better get rid of this guy. Oh, see, here. You better talk respectfully. Please go, Mr. Metcalf. But I can't leave without... You heard what he said. Get out. Hey... What is this? Metcalf, I've asked you to go to your quarters. Captain, are you taking his side? Do as I say. Are you in favor of his... Louis, why did you do that? Because that charge is going off any second. And he's been through your locker. He found some powder and fuses. Now he'll know I'm mixed up in this, too. That can mean we lose... There it is. What happens now? When the report comes in, I'll alert all members of the crew to stand by to abandon ship. What happens with Metcalf? We leave him here. He uh, liked the ship so much, we'll let him go down with it. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Already, the bells of our colleges have called nearly two and a half million eager young Americans back to their books and classrooms to be given one of the greatest advantages of all, a college education. There's a boy in our block who'd give anything to answer that bell. Brightest kid you ever met. All his life, he's planned on college, then law school. But it's all washed up now. His dad's last illness wiped out the family savings. Now that boy's had to go to work to help support his two younger brothers. It's a shame his father never heard of an equitable education fund. What's that? An equitable education fund is a plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society... 
to make certain that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have, regardless of what happens to you. Now, here are three things about the plan you should consider. First, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Second, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Third, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. That's exactly the plan I've been looking for, Mr. Keating. I think I'll see my Equitable Society representative first thing tomorrow. That's the thing to do. See an Equitable Society representative as soon as possible. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Remember, from the moment you set up an Equitable Education Fund, you make sure that when the college bells ring for your boy or girl, they will be ready to answer the call. Now back to the FBI file, The Phantom Mine. The crime being committed in tonight's case from the files of your FBI is a serious one, but it is only one of the more than 5,000 major crimes committed every day in the United States. Your FBI cooperates in bringing this series of official radio programs to you because it wants to acquaint you with the ways of the criminal so that you, as an individual, will be better able to cope with every particular type of lawbreaker. Your FBI does this because it has a responsibility to you, a responsibility which involves fighting America's army of criminals to the best of its ability. But you, the individual citizen, also have a responsibility. It is up to you, if you wish to see the crime wave conquered, to see to it that you have a strong local police force and that that local police force is adequately paid. Money saved by cutting police protection or by not allowing local policemen to earn a living wage is not in the long run money saved. For where protection is inadequate, crime increases. In one major city in the United States, a city of well over a million population, A survey determined that more than 50% of the local police were so poorly paid that they were in constant debt. A companion survey showed that crime this year in that city has risen more than 50%. Your local policeman's life is at stake when he puts on his uniform. It is your duty to see to it that while he risks that life, he is paid a living wage. Tonight's file continues in a waterfront house that is occupied by Mr. Grant, owner of the scuttled ship. He is just greeting a visitor. Welcome home, Captain. It's good to see you. Well, have you got a drink? I need one. Sure. Here. I'll take it straight, thanks. Very well. And I'll join you. Let's drink to the SS Marion Green, the best ship I ever skipped. And the best one I ever owned. <laughs> <laughs> well, where's Louis? Didn't he come with you? He'll be here. He was in the other boat. They're probably still asking them the same questions they asked me. Who asked you any questions? Uh, The Coast Guard. They picked us up. After the ship went down? Sure. We rode for about an hour before they sighted us. What kind of questions did they ask you? Where was I at the time of the explosion? Whether I saw anything? Stuff like that. Anybody in the crew suspicious that it wasn't an accident? Yes. Metcalf, chief engineer. What did he find out? That Louis had explosives. How did you deal with him? Uh, Louis knocked him out. We left him in the cabin after the ship went under. Oh. Oh. Hello? Hello, Mr. Grant. Uh, That's right. This is Louie, Mr. Grant. Did the captain come in yet? Yes, he just got here a couple of minutes ago. Where are you? I'm still downtown. The Coast Guard just let us go. Were they suspicious? No, but they will be. What? What do you mean? Did the captain tell you about the engineer, Metcalf? Yes. Well, he's still alive. I thought he went down with the ship. So did I, but when we were rowing away, we... We heard somebody yelling for help. It was Metcalf, so we picked him up. Well, what did you do that for? Well, what could I do? There were 14 other guys in the boat. What did Metcalf say when he saw you? Didn't have a chance to say anything. As soon as we pulled him into the boat, he passed out. Where is he now? At emergency hospital. Hmm. Listen to me, Louie, and get this straight. Yes, Mr. Grant, what is it? Get into that hospital and get to Metcalf. <laughs> Uh, 
Jim, this is a tough one. I thought you had the right answer when you got that list of new registrations on all boats. If Grant bought a boat in the last two months, it must be one of the boats on this list. I agree with you there, Jim, but we've checked almost every one of those names. All but three. And they're all owned by corporations. Now, this first one, the SS Dorothy Drew, is owned by a corporation in Santa Monica, California. Now, the Los Angeles office is checking on that one for us. With a two-hour difference in time, we might not get an answer until tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, but there's nothing we can do about that, son. The second ship, the SS Marion Green, is owned by the Black and White Corporation. We can't check on them until tomorrow morning, either. Oh, I did get some details on the SS Marion Green, though. What were they? Well, she's a 4,000-ton freighter, equipped as a lumber carrier. She can carry about two and a half million feet of lumber. Did you find out what the Black and White Corporation paid for her? Yes, they paid 105000 The last owner said that the Black and White Corporation would have to spend about $15,000 in repairs to make her seaworthy again. That's a pretty good buy. There aren't many 4,000 tonners around you can pick up for 120000 I know. Now, the ABC Handling Corporation owns the third ship. That's the SS Edith Summers. There doesn't seem to be any way of finding out anything about them until tomorrow either. Well, maybe we ought to call it a night, Jim, and get a fresh start in the morning. Yeah, I suppose you're right. I don't suppose there's much else to do. I'll get it. Right. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Hello, Mr. Taylor. This is Dr. Elliot over at the emergency hospital. Yes, Doctor. Anything I can do for you? Well, I called police headquarters to report this, and they told me to call the FBI. I've just treated a man named Joe Medcalf for shock. He came to for a little while and explained that he was in a shipwreck, but that the wreck was no accident. Now, let me get the facts on this straight, Dr. Elliot. This uh, Mr. Metcalf claims that there was a deliberate scuttling in the ship that he was on. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Did he tell you the name of the ship? Why, yes, he did. It was the SS Marion Green. Thank you for calling, Dr. Elliot. I'll be right over to talk to Mr. Metcalf. What time is it, Captain? Uh, a little after four. No, he called over an hour ago. Why haven't we heard from him? I don't know. I can't wait around much more. I've got things to do, Mr. Grant. Things to take care of. Now, I suppose you pay me off and I'll be getting along. Pay you? For what? The job I did. Captain, I'd like to point out to you that there's a man named Metcalf who, by your own admission, may jam up this whole deal. So? If the deal's jammed up, I don't collect from the insurance companies. And if I don't collect, Captain, neither do you. Now, just a minute. I made a deal with you to sink a ship. Well, right now, that ship's at the bottom of the ocean. That was only part of the deal. The most important phase of it was making it appear to be an accident. That you didn't deliver. Look, can I help it if Louis messed things up? He was your responsibility. You hired him, Mr. Grant. Captain, that has nothing to do with... Who is it? Me, Louis. Oh. Hello, Mr. Grant. Hello, Captain. Uh, Where do you want me to put your chief engineer? What's the matter, Jim? You look beat. I'm getting a little tired of these wild goose chases. What happened this time? Well, I got over to the hospital. That doctor took me up to talk to Metcalf. Well, don't tell me he changed his story. Worse than that, Tom, he was gone. He w- well, how could that happen? A friend came in and took him out. He told the nurse he was a shipmate of Metcalf's. Did the doctor tell you what Metcalf said while he was conscious? Yes. He said he was the engineer aboard the SS Marion Green. You know, it's probably the boat that Grant bought. Did Metcalf's story explain why he bought it? Yes, from what Metcalf told the doctor, the SS Marion Green was purposely scuttled. And I think we'll find that that ship was very heavily insured. Metcalf's the only one, then, who could prevent Grant from collecting on that insurance. That's it. So the shipmate who came to the hospital and got Metcalf out must be one of Grant's men. I would think so. You know, I hate to think of the treatment they'll give him. Checked every possible record, Jim. Every boarding house, every hotel, every rental listed at the real estate board. There isn't a single Harry Grant on any of those lists. Oh, Metcalf gave this waterproof pouch to Dr. Elliott before he passed out again. Oh? Said there were some papers in it that he got out of a drawer in the captain's cabin just before he jumped off the ship. For Metcalf's sake, I hope there's something in here that'll tell us where Grant is. Hey, you take half and I'll take half. I'll take these. Yeah. Uh, doesn't seem to be anything here, Jim, except some paid Wait bills. Wait a minute. I think I've got something, Tom. Listen uh, to this. It's a note to the captain saying I'll come aboard about 10 o'clock to discuss final plans with you. And it's signed with the initials H.G. Standing for Harry Grant. I should think so. There's no return address on the envelope. It's very common stationery, too, Jim. There wouldn't be any chance of tracing the purchaser of this stuff. No. No, That's right. I think we might find out where Mr. Grant sent this from, though. Let's get a classified telephone directory. (laughs) 
He's coming to. Oh. You better stop hitting him, Louie. Oh. Why, you, you afraid I'll hurt him? No, we want to talk to him. Uh, Metcalf. Metcalf, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you, Good. Captain. Good, and answer a few questions. Do you remember being at the hospital? Uh-huh. Did you talk to anybody at the hospital? Uh-huh. What did you say to him? I told him all about you and the wiper and blowing up the ship. Oh, uh. How do we handle this, Mr. Grant? There's a way. Metcalf is the only one who actually saw Louie in the engine room, isn't he? That's right. Now, what's that got to do with it? Then he's the only one that can prove anything. You forget about the doctor at the hospital. You blab as sure as you're born. Uh, what do you think my lawyer will say to him on the stand? I don't know. He'll say, Doctor, isn't it possible that a man of Mr. Metcalf's age might get hysterical and delirious after an accident like that? The doctor will have to say yes, and that will be all there is to it. I see. That means that if Metcalf is dead and can't be found, the insurance company has to pay. Well, I don't carry a gun. Louie does, don't you, Louie? Well, I lost mine when the ship went down. You'll find one in that top drawer. Get it and take care of him. Okay. Is it loaded? Try it and find out. You're not trying anything. What? What is this? Hold it. Special agents of the FBI. Well, Metcalf's still alive, Jim. Good, Tom. What are you two doing here? We came here to serve warrants for arrest on the three of you. Uh, what are the charges? Conspiracy to defraud. See here, that's a serious charge to make without any proof. I think we've got enough proof on that charge. And when we get back to headquarters, we'll add another charge against all of you. Attempted murder. Harry Grant, Captain Spencer, and Louis Jackson were all tried in a federal court and convicted on both charges. They are now serving long terms in the federal penitentiary. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI was solved because Special Agent Jim Taylor noticed that there was no stamp on the envelope containing the note found among the captain's papers. He therefore reasoned that it had been delivered by some messenger. A check of the messenger services listed in the classified telephone directory revealed that one of those services had been summoned by Mr. Grant to deliver the note to Captain Spencer aboard the SS Marion Green. A further check of the delivery slip showed that the note had been sent from number 415 Ocean Avenue, and it was at that address that Special Agents Taylor and Allen located the three criminals. What was even more important than the capture of the criminal triumvirate was the fact that your FBI was able to save the life of an innocent person. And thus, once more, your FBI, by the speed of its investigative procedure, succeeded in performing its double function of protecting not only your property, but your lives. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, Joe, I understand there's one thing you'd like to clear up about an equitable education fund. Yes, Mr. Keating. Are these funds flexible? Can they be increased later if I can afford it? They certainly can. Many young fathers start with an equitable education fund that would pay part of a boy or girl's way through college. Then, as the family income goes up, the amount of the education fund is increased. Your equitable representative will be glad to show you just how it's done. Look him up soon. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. An authentic record of the operations of one of the cunningest of the criminal breed, the confidence man. Its subject, fraud. Its title, the atomic swindle. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. The director, Sid Goodman. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, 
and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Atomic Swindle on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. The Equitable Life Assurance Society is a great mutual institution organized to serve America. Therefore, one of the Equitable Society's major objectives is to make all possible contributions to the welfare and stability of American business, on which so many of the Equitable Society's nearly four million members depend. Tonight's middle commercial is addressed to people who personally own some part of the business enterprise in which they are employed. For such owners... This commercial, due in about 14 minutes, will have information from the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Two Wise Men. In the past six months, there have been almost 380,000 fingerprint arrest records added to the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, an addition which brings the number of such fingerprint records to the staggering total of seven and a half million. That figure, seven and a half million, can be said quickly, can be rolled off the tongue and forgotten just as quickly. But your FBI asks you to stop for a moment and to realize what that figure represents. These cards represent seven and a half million people who have been arrested in the United States. Since we have slightly more than 140 million people in the country, it means that one out of every 18 among us has an arrest record. Your FBI implores you to do everything that you can to help fight the crime wave lest the next survey show that the figure has risen beyond its present high record, and we find ourselves literally engulfed in every type of crime, from larceny to murder. Tonight's file opens in a small Midwestern town. It is early morning. Two men, one old, one young, are hard at work digging a hole with pick and shovel. <coughs> What's the matter, Billy Boy? Hey, this is this is kind of rugged. For a young fella like you? Why, your Uncle Andy and me do this kind of work all the time. Yeah, I know. I know. Come on, boy, get to digging. I wish Uncle Andy was here now. What? I said I wish Uncle Andy was here now instead of me. <laughs> Once we agree, son, so do I. You know, he'd be here, too, if his back wasn't all twisted up with rheumatism. Hey, tell me something, will you? Yeah, what's that? Why do you old guys always do everything the hard way? What do you mean? Well, why can't you use one of them drills on this hole? You could do the whole job ten times quicker. Really? You think me and your uncle are pretty old-fashioned, don't you? Yeah. I thought so. Well, let me tell you something, son. There's a lot you could learn from our old-fashioned ways. Huh. Like what, for instance? Like what we're doing right now. Oh? Uh -huh. There's plenty of quick ways to do this same job. I'll grant you that. But once we're inside this bank, we can blow the vault and take the money without anybody ever knowing we're doing it. Uh -huh. 
The next day, FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor picks up Agent Carl Perry in front of the railroad station. Yo, Carl. Oh, Carl, over here. Oh, hello, Jim. Hi. Come on, hop in. Oh, thanks. Of course. Good to see you. Well, I must say this is service, being met at the station. <laughs> Look, I didn't come down here to drive you back to the office. I just wanted to save us some time. Why, what's the rush? We've been assigned to work together on a case that just came in. Oh, good. What's it all about? Well, there was a bank burglary in Centerville early this morning. Two men got into the bank by tunneling under the back of the building. Mm, any leads? Well, we get more than leads, Carl. We know who did it. Already? Oh. Well, the robbers parked their car a block away from the bank in front of a home occupied by some people named Duncan. Uh-huh. Mr. Duncan looked out the window and... Copied down the number on the license plate so he could make a complaint about it. And his complaint turned out to be an asset. That's right. Oh, good boy. Car was found abandoned this morning at a tourist cabin out on Route 81. We got some fingerprints out of it. Turned out to belong to a man named Roy Lyons. I don't think I know that name. Oh, there's no reason why you should, Car. From his record, he's been a petty larceny thief for about 45 years. Well, how old is he? 63. He was working with a boy of 19. How do you know that? Well, we found a jacket inside the bank that had an eyeglass case in one of the pockets. The case was initial WOC. Oh, uh, lights changed, Jim. Oh, yeah. Well, we went through Roy Lyons' arrest record. Found out he was picked up a year ago with a boy named William O. Caldwell. Oh, that certainly ties in. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's safe to assume it's the same boy. We'll know in a little while, though, for sure. Why? Well, we're headed for the tourist camp where the robber's car was found abandoned. Oh? I've got pictures of Lyons and Caldwell in my pocket. Carl, if they make positive identification at the tourist camp, we can start our search from there. Andy? Yes, Roy? Care for a little more cocoa? Oh, not, not right now, thanks. Oh, my back. Rheumatism's really acting up, huh? Yes, I wish my nephew'd get back with that mustard plaster. Uh, you all done counting the money? Uh-huh. How much? $1,237.50. Oh, not a bad night's work. Oh, too bad you couldn't have been with us. Well, I, I wasn't exactly idle. What do you mean, Andy? I wrote some letters. What kind of letters? Uh, do you remember that sucker list I had in the trunk? Which one? Men over 60. Oh, sure. <laughs> That's the one we never knew how to use. I figured a way to put it to work. Well, good boy, Andy. How'd you do it? Well, we've been accumulating a lot of coins along with the paper money. It's tough for us to get rid of it. Oh, uh, yeah. That's why I sent out the letters. We're starting a club. What kind of a club? One of them old age clubs. Oh. I'll be president. Good. You'll be treasurer. Fine. Uh, what's the uh, aims of the club? We're charging a dollar to join and a quarter a week dues. That way, nobody will be suspicious if we get a couple of hundred dollars in silver. Well, that's a real idea, Andy. Well, I'm glad that... Oh, 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 darn that back. Can I get you something? Oh, no. Well, where's Billy with the plaster? I told him to hurry. Uh... Andy, I'm afraid that boy does just as he pleases. Uh, how was he on the job last night? Mm, kind of fresh. I uh, don't like to say this, Andy, but he's getting a little too big for his britches. How do you mean... He's been flashing money around, being a big shot. That could get us in trouble. It sure could. Oh, I'll have a talk with the boy as soon as he gets here. Uh, let me have some of that cocoa. Carl, I wish something would come in on that alarm on the old man and the boy. If they remained in the immediate neighborhood, I think they'd have been spotted by now. Yeah, I'm afraid they've gotten to wherever they were going, though. If these alarms don't produce results in the first five hours, they usually don't produce at all. Jim, if we could only get some kind of a lead that would tell us which way they headed when they left the tourist cabin. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to have to let this one go for a little while. You mean just quit on it? No, not exactly. While you were calling police headquarters, I went in to talk to the SAC. About what? About attacking this problem from an entirely new angle. 
What's that? Well, there was a bank burglary about ten days ago over at Midland Falls. The same method of entering the bank was used in both cases. Mm, I didn't know that. Well, the bank at Midland Falls was not covered by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. That's why we haven't been in on it up to now. Oh, I see. I think the same pair probably robbed both banks. Mm, That's a safe speculation, Jim. Well, the SAC has given us permission to work on the Midland Falls burglary because, well, solving that one would automatically solve the other case for us, too. Well, what do we do first, Jim? Well, Midland Falls is only about 65 miles from here. Let's drive up there first thing in the morning. How does your back feel now, Andy? Still miserable, Roy. I was thinking we might go back to work tomorrow night. I got a bank all picked out for us. Where? Well, coming home from Centerville the other night, we went through a little place called Bowling Green. They've got the prettiest little bank there you ever saw. I remember Bowling Green. Got arrested there once. Uh, Did you stop and uh, look the bank over? No need to. There's a vacant lot next door. I think that pipe's out, Andy. Well, hand me the tobacco, will you? Yeah, sure. Here. Hi. Well, where have you been? Out. Thought you went to get your poor uncle a back plaster. I forgot. Uh, Billy, you've been forgetting too many things here lately. Mostly your manners. You've now, been... look, I don't want to hear any long-winded lectures. I'm fed up with those routines. Is that a fact? Yes. And I came home here especially to tell you that. They must be spiking the grape juice down at the pool. (laughs) Very funny. You're talking mighty big, son. Uh, It's time I did. I've been kicked around by you two just long enough. What do you mean, kicked around? I've been doing 50% of the work. For 50% of the work, I want 50% of the money. Look, son. We brought you into this combination strictly as an apprentice. Uh, That is right. And we tried to teach you all we know. (laughs) What do you think I could learn from old-fashioned jokers like you? Ah, You're 50 years behind the times, both of you. Then why do you work for us? I'm not after tonight. But before I pull out, there's uh, one thing we got to get straight. What's that? The payoff from last night. I want half. You may want half, son, but you ain't getting it. I got a gun here that says I am. Well? Now, where'd you put the money? Put that gun away, son. It might go off and scare all of us. Look, I'm on the level about this. Uh, Roy, I believe he is. Now, get me that money. Uh, You better do as he says, Roy. Uh, Very well. (laughs) Good work, Roy. Get his gun. Right. Well, what happened? Pull the rug out from under you, that's all. (laughs) That's one of them old-fashioned things you was complaining about. (laughs) Come on, Andy. Let's tie him up. We will return to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI in just a minute. Now a brief case from the official files of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, showing how equitable business insurance helps stabilize our American economic system. Names used are fictitious, but the case is an actual one. We are in the office of Mr. Edward Bradshaw, president of a successful metal parts business in New England. Harry Summers, our executive vice president, takes complete charge of personnel, purchasing, and manufacturing. George Gibbon is our sales manager. He knows all our customers. He brings in the business. Sounds like two pretty valuable men to me. Yes, they certainly are. If we lost either one, it would take months to replace them. And that's what used to keep me lying awake at night, trying to figure out what I'd do if either one of them should die. You don't look like a worried man to me now, Mr. Bradshaw. I'm not. I got the answer from an Equitable Society business insurance specialist. His suggestion was $50,000 worth of insurance on the lives of each of these two key men payable to the company. That would tide you over the period while you're looking around for a replacement. Right. And it would help pay for the replacement when we found him. I look on this life insurance on our key man as a safeguard for the security of every man and woman who works for us. No question about it, that equitable society business insurance specialist certainly took a load off my mind. Right, Mr. Bradshaw. 
And now let me extend an invitation from the Equitable Society to the businessmen in this radio audience. An Equitable Society business insurance specialist will be glad to sit down with you and your associates. He's fully qualified by experience and training to work out a plan that's sound in every detail and tailor-made for your business. Have your secretary call the nearest Equitable office and ask for the manager or dictate a brief note to the home office of the Equitable Society in New York City. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Two Wise Men. The attitude of the young man in tonight's case from the files of your FBI is too widespread to require any explanation. It is almost one of the prerequisites of youth that they think they know how to do things better than those who are older. And as you have seen, that attitude is as true among criminals as among law-abiding citizens. The young man you have met, unfortunately, is representative of the dominant age group among those who have been arrested since the first of this year. According to the FBI survey mentioned earlier in this program, the highest frequency of arrests occurred in the 21, 22, 23, and 19-year-old groups in that order. The age group 50 and over, represented tonight by the two old men, was not far behind in this newest survey. Between them, those age groups combined to produce a total of approximately one-third of all recorded arrests. Many of the youngsters, those in the 19 to 23 bracket, are yesterday's juvenile delinquents. The boys of that age group are still young enough to be saved. Indeed, they must be saved. For if society should fail them entirely, they will soon cease to be yesterday's juvenile delinquents. Instead, they will be tomorrow's hardened criminals. Tonight's file continues late the next afternoon in a room at police headquarters in Midland Falls. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, Carl. I just got back here, Jim. Oh, how'd you make out? Well, after I left you, I went to the bank. Uh -huh. They couldn't give us much information, which we didn't already have. But I did get this, uh, this nail puller. No? From whom? From Mr. Crawford at the bank. It was left in the vaults the night of the burglary. Hmm. Let me take a look at that, huh? Mm -hmm. Name stamped on it. It's pretty well rubbed out, though. I put it under black light and read it. It says oh. uh, E.G. Bentley and Company, Lumber. Well, that's a local company. Did you mm -hmm. call them? Uh, yes, but they haven't given away any of these nail pullers for over ten years. Well, that takes care of the possibility of tracing it directly, then. Yeah. Well, maybe it'll fit in later on. How did you make out? Well, the local police and I interviewed every person in Midland Falls. <laughs> well, no wonder you've been gone all day. Yeah. After comparing notes, I found that the car used in the burglary here was a stolen 1946 black Buick convertible. Mm-hmm. Checking on the license number, I learned the car was stolen from a private garage at Newton Center on September 19th. Well, that was ten days before the bank here was burglarized. That's right. Oh, any prints found in the car? Yes. Yes, prints identified as those of Lyons and of Corwell. That figured. In examining the car after it had been abandoned, a large jack, the kind they use on tractors, was found in it. Well, was the car stolen from a farmer, Jim? No. No, that's why I think they probably stole the jack somewhere else. Carl, let me that map over there, will you? Oh, sure. Here you are. Right, let's spread it out now. Hold it down there. Huh? You bet. Now, here, Carl. Mm -hmm. If you were to take this territory in here, mm -hmm. on the east and the south of Midland Falls, mm -hmm. I'd take the west and the north. We could interview every farmer around here and see if we can find out where that jack came from. Okay. When we're finished, let's meet back here. <laughs> You know something, Roy? What? Maybe we should have stayed home and answered our mail. We'd have made more money that way. On the old age club, you mean? Yeah. The letters are flocking in. Why did you dangle at those fellas to make it sound so good? Well, I told them we'd ask the government for a dollar a week for every year they've been alive. Well, that means I'd get $63 a week. That's right. If 
If I was sure of getting that, I wouldn't be driving to Bowling Green in the dead of night to rob a bank. <laughs> that is a good point. Andy, well, have you made up your mind yet about what you're going to do with young Billy? No. It ain't going to be practical to keep him tied up in the bedroom too long. I know. What would you do if you was me? <laughs> That's easy. I'd kill him. Carl. Huh? Carl, I came up lucky. I found the farm of the Jack was stolen from. Oh, good. He said that an old man and a young boy in a 1946 black Buick convertible stopped at his farm on September 29th. Well, wasn't that the day of the burglary here? That's right. He said they came to his farm and wanted to borrow a jack so they could change a tire. Was he sure that it was Lyons and Caldwell? Yes, yes. He positively identified both pictures. Oh, they also stole that nail puller from his tool chest. Well, we've certainly got enough evidence now. Yeah, but that hasn't stopped them. They committed another burglary last night on a federally insured bank. What? Yeah, they employed their same modus operandi on a bank in Bowling Green. Well, they didn't waste much time. Yeah, I know. That's one of the reasons we'd better catch them in a hurry. Carl, let's see where we stand, huh? Take a look at the map. Okay. Now, over here, approximately 55 miles from Midland Falls is Newton Center. That's right. The car that was used to burglarize the bank in Midland Falls on September 29th was stolen from Newton Center 10 days earlier on September 19th. Uh huh. Now, this farm where the jack and the nail puller was stolen is here. That's about six miles due west of Midland Falls. Uh huh. Now, that means two things, Carl. First, Lyons and Corwell came into Midland Falls from the west. They were at this farm on the day of the big burglary. How? Correct? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, from Newton Center to this farm is approximately 49 miles. That's right. Now, if they were fleeing from Newton Center after stealing the car, they certainly would have covered more distance than 49 miles in 10 days. I'll buy that. Well, then, Carl, I think we can assume that during the period between the stealing of the car and the burglarizing in the Midland Falls Bank... They live somewhere in between. Oh, Jim, it'll be a big job checking every house in that 50-mile stretch. Yeah, I know that, Carl, but if they stopped at the farm to fix a flat, they might very well have had some other trouble with that tire. Maybe. I think what we ought to do now is start checking every gas station between that farm and Newton Center. No luck here, Carl. We've covered 25 miles already. Yeah, I know that. They couldn't have had too much trouble with that tire. Any chance they used another road, Jim? There is no other road between Newton Center and Midland Falls. So let's go, Carl. We've got to keep trying. No luck here either. Only nine more miles to Newton Center, Jim. Yeah, maybe we're betting on a dead horse. It doesn't even look like they stopped at any of these places for gas, let alone tire repair. Well, Jim, there can't be too many more gas stations. We only need one, Carl. Let's go. <laughs> Carl, we hit the jackpot. You mean they were in here? Yes, on September 26th. Well, that's a week after the car was stolen. That's right. The attendants said they live somewhere in this immediate neighborhood. I think there's a way to find their exact address. Come on, let's drive into the nearest town before the store is closed. Who's that? It's me, Andy. Oh, where have you been? Just took a little walk. Thought I'd leave you alone so you could make up your mind. About what? Your nephew. Oh, that was real thoughtful of you, Roy. Well, after all, the boy is your flesh and blood. I knew it'd be hard for you to decide. You made up your mind yet? Uh-huh. What did you decide? Don't see any way out but to kill him. Oh. But, Andy, I... Don't want you to do it. Huh? You're too old to start killing anyone now. Oh, I'm not going to. I call that young fellow Green. He does that type of work, you know. I've heard he's a nice, polite young fellow. Yes, I, I like throwing a boy like that, whatever work I can. And this will be good experience for him, too. When did he say he'd be able to take care of it? We promised he'd be over later this evening. Oh, fine. Uh, did you mail those letters while you were out? Uh-huh. And I picked up this batch from the box. My goodness. Club is certainly growing. We're getting a lot of money from this. I know, but 
Well, it's not our money. It belongs to the members. It wouldn't be very honest uh, of us to touch it. Oh, I uh, guess that's the young man who's going to take care of my nephew. Well, I'll go let him in. Uh, thanks, Roy. Are you Mr. Green? No, I'm Mr. Taylor. Your name is Roy Lyons. That's right. How did you know? We're special agents of the FBI. Oh. We've got warrants here for the arrest of you and William O. Caldwell. Carl. Yeah? See if Caldwell is any place in the apartment. Right, Jim. Uh, Mr. Green, bring a friend to help him, Roy? Uh, no, Andy. These men are from the FBI. Oh? Looking for Billy? I'm looking for all of you. Now, come along with me. Andy Spencer received a 50-year sentence for bank burglary, and Roy Lyons and Bill Caldwell received 25 years each. Once the two special agents of your FBI were able to determine in what vicinity the trio of bank burglars resided, they were able to use an earlier clue, the eyeglass case bearing the initials W.O.C., the optician in that particular neighborhood identified the eyeglass case as having been delivered to William O. Caldwell, and he supplied young Caldwell's address. Caldwell's subsequent confession closed the files on all three bank burglaries. And thus, your FBI was able to prevent the further looting of banks in which you have your money deposited by this calculating trio. Tonight's case illustrates to what length the special agents of your FBI will go in protecting your property... For in this investigation, in a period of 72 hours, they interviewed not only every resident of Midland Falls, and that included every man, woman, and child, but also every farmer in the territory for six miles around Midland Falls. And then, every gas station attendant along a main highway for a distance of 55 miles. That is hard work. But the special agents of your FBI have been trained to realize that the only way to investigate a crime is to do it thoroughly. And in almost every case, that means hard work. More hard work, and still more, until the criminal is caught. In just a moment... We will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now one last word about business insurance. The reason why the Equitable Society emphasizes this type of insurance is very simple. The brains and experience responsible for the success of a business enterprise have a cash value and should therefore be protected by insurance like any other valuable asset. Equitable Society representatives have worked out plans for all types of business from progressive corner stores and successful law partnerships to large organizations with thousands on their payrolls. Plan now to enlist the invaluable help that is yours for the asking from a trained business insurance specialist of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The story exposing the clever hoax perpetrated by a trio of expert con men. Its subject, fraud. Its title, The Gridiron Swindle. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This Is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Gridiron Swindle on This Is Your FBI. This 
is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. The Equitable Life Assurance Society is a great mutual institution organized to serve Americans and America. Therefore, one of the Equitable Society's major objectives is to make all possible contributions to the welfare and stability of American business, on which so many of the Equitable Society's nearly four million members depend for their livelihood. Tonight's middle commercial is addressed to people who personally own some part of the business enterprise in which they are employed. For such owners, this commercial, due in about 14 minutes, will have information of great importance from the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Gridiron Swindle. The first thing a newspaper reporter learns is that in order to write the lead on a story, he must supply the answers to five questions. What, where, who, how, and when. Because special agents of your FBI and newspaper men are both investigators, it is not unnatural that the members of the Federal Bureau of Investigation should be able to answer those questions with respect to crime. In order to help them keep their answers up to date, your FBI makes periodic surveys of the crime situation, one of which has just been concluded. The study reveals many shocking facts, with perhaps the most shocking being the fact that in the first six months of this year, the number of larcenies, a number which includes swindles, amounted to more than 277,000, or more than 1,500 every day. Should those figures fail to impress you, should you feel that it's much ado about little, then perhaps you might be interested to know that the loot taken by criminals in those larcenies represented cash and property valued at more than $17 million. Tonight's file opens in a second-floor room of a hotel located in a large Midwestern city. A young man is pacing the floor nervously while a lean, gray-haired man sits in the corner sipping a cup of black coffee. Well, you did it. You really did it this time. Wally, I've apologized in every way I know. If I could, I'd I'd give you the money back. I'll try to deposit that in the morning. Who's that? Me. Oh. What are you doing home so early? Tell her, Uncle Ed. An unfortunate accident occurred, my dear. Uncle Ed, you've been drinking again. Drinking? You should have seen him with the sucker. What happened? We're supposed to get the sucker drunk. Uh Uh-huh. Instead of that, your dear Uncle Ed would get so plastered, he starts to lift this guy's wallet and falls right off his chair. Mm, I don't understand it. I was sitting firmly on the chair, and all of a sudden... You were sitting firmly on cloud number seven. Well, stay up there if you like it, but don't hang around Charlotte and me. From now on, we're traveling light. Wally, I I don't like to call attention to my past kindnesses, but if you remember, I gave you a car when you got out of reform school. A stolen car? Wally, you you obviously don't appreciate the sentiment that was involved. I also gave you your start in this business. Oh, now, look, I've heard this routine a hundred times. It's true, Wally. You keep out of this. But, Wally, he's my uncle, and I'm not going to stand by and have you just kick him out. Oh, all right, all right. We can argue about that when we get home. Right now, we got something else to worry about. What's that? How do we get out of this hotel without blowing our clothes? Oh, that's a relatively simple matter, my boy. All we have to do is take the sheets from those beds, tie them together, and let ourselves gently but firmly to the delightful terra firma below. A few 
few days later, in an FBI field office, Special Agent George Watson is approaching the desk of Agent Jim Taylor. Hi, Jim. Hello, George. Back from court so soon? Yeah, I'm going in to ask the SAC if I can have some time off. I don't think you'll get it, George. Why not? Because he's already assigned you to work on a new case with me. Oh, what's this one about? Well, we received a teletype from the sheriff of a small town named Hudson. It's about 300 miles from here. I know the place. Oh, well, he said he was hanging around a gas station when a car pulled in to fill up. Uh-huh. One of the men in the car seemed a little drunk. As he got out, he walked over to the sheriff and asked him if he had any ice in his pocket. Oh, oh fine. And in his conversation, he mentioned to the sheriff that they were coming here. So? Well, after they left, the sheriff couldn't get the old drunk's face out of his mind. He knew he'd seen it somewhere before, so he went back to his office and checked through the FBI files. Sure enough, there it was. Who is he? His name is Ed Garvey. I don't know him, at least by that name. Well, he's been a confidence man for about 40 years. Well, they change their names so often, I, I guess I never ran across him. Now, there was another man and woman in the car. The sheriff found a flyer on the man. His name is Wally Billings. He and Garvey have worked together in the past. At what? The old lemon pool swindle, you know, where they get the victim to take cash out of the bank, get him drunk, and then pick his pocket. Uh-huh. I had an alarm sent out to every local police department between here and Hudson. How long ago? A couple of hours ago. Come on, let's walk down to the teletype room. Okay. Maybe they've been caught by now and you can get that time off. Ah, good morning, my dear. Good morning, Uncle Ed. Where's Wally? He went out. He's still mad at you. Because I got out of the car and discussed generalities with a stranger? You did not depict the sheriff, did you? Charlotte, I was partially a man of distinction at that moment. I didn't notice that the gentleman was an arm of the law. Well, Wally had a right to be mad. Well, he isn't any longer. I've mended the breach. You mean you made up with him? Yes. How? Oh, I gave him a very commercial idea. It's a little thing based on the current national hysteria over football. Oh, that's nice. Where is Wally? He had a date. Mm, with whom? A Mrs. Cornelius Hines. Who is Mrs. Cornelius Hines? Well, Wally said she was a big society lady. He's building her up for something. He said it looked good. Mm, that's fine. Uncle Ed, are you going out? Uh, yes. Well, Wally said to make you promise one thing. What is that? He said to ask you not to get drunk. Charlotte, you know I never drink when I attend the spot of kings. Are you going to the races? Yes. But you have no money. My dear girl... Those racetrack trains are very crowded. And in a jostling mob, it is a well-known fact that uh, wallets are very likely to slip from one pocket to another. Well, goodbye, my dear. Ah, this is certainly a beautiful view from here, Mrs. Hines. I insisted on the penthouse. I think if you must live in a city, you should at least be able to look down on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> Another cup of tea, Mr. Billings. Oh, no. No, thanks. You're probably wondering why I called you. Frankly, I am. Well, I read about you in the papers. I also read about your pet charity. Oh? Charities happen to be my business, Mrs. Hines. I'm a professional promoter. I raise money for charities and charge a percentage. I see. I have a feeling that I could be quite useful to you... Well, I never have used high-pressure tactics. Oh, this isn't high-pressure, Mrs. Hines. I have a means of making money for your charity that will have the public clamoring to give you money. Really? Take a look at this. What is it? Those are football games this coming Saturday. Yes? People all over the country buy these cards for from $1 to $10. But why? They try to pick winners. If they do, they win. And if they don't? They lose. Of course, more lose than win, so the people who sell the cards make money. Oh. So if we sold the cards, we could raise a couple of thousand dollars for your charity every Saturday. Well, that sounds splendid. Think you'd like to try it? Well, You I... can get society girls to sell them for you. That would really make them move. Now, uh, what do you say? Mr. Billings, I... I think I like your idea. Call me in the morning. Jim, any word yet on Billings and Garvey? No, not yet, George. How about giving their pictures to the newspapers? Maybe we can smoke them out that way. I thought of that, George, and the SAC put thumbs down on the idea. He's afraid it'd scare them off. 
The old man, Garvey, is pretty slippery. He doesn't draw the line any place. Why, do you know he once sold a hard-shelled businessman a bridge across the Missouri River? What? Yes, he convinced this man he was from the Department of the Interior. And that as a defense measure in the event of war, the government was going to tear down the bridge and build a tunnel. Oh, no. Oh, yes. This man was in the scrap iron business, and he sold him the bridge for $16,000. And in cash. Oh, excuse me. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes, Sergeant. No, no, I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Hmm. Page seven? Yeah, I'll get a copy right away. Thanks very much for calling. George, is that the journal you brought in with you? Yes. Oh, can I see it, please? Sure, here. Thanks. Right. That was Sergeant O'Rourke down at police headquarters. Said there was a picture on page seven that might interest us. Mm-hmm. Hey, look at this picture of the horse that won the big race yesterday. Oh, uh, let's see. There. There's our man Garvey practically weighing in with a jockey. Well, that proves he's living here, Jim. Yes. Now let's see if we can find out where. Charlotte! Charlotte! Where are my shoes? I put them away. Wally told me to. Uh, Where is he now? I don't know. He just said he was going out. And for me to see that you didn't. You can sit and talk to me. Uh, No disrespect, my dear, but that happens to be my idea of conversational solitaire. Uncle Ed, what's this big idea you gave Wally? It concerns football. But how? Have you ever seen a football pool guard, Charlotte? You mean where you pick winners and get odds? Exactly. Is that the idea? Yes. Well, what's so great about that? Ah, the variation I thought of. With our cards, every player must win. Why? Because we take close games. And we give 20 and 30 points to the player. (laughs) Not even a moron could lose. Then how do we win? We sell the cards in the sweet name of charity. And then, well, well, you know the saying, charity begins at home. Oh, must be going good. Look, Wally put this out of the paper this morning. It's a picture of Mrs. Hines selling the first football card to the mayor. (laughs) So they've even got the mayor going for... Say, Charlotte. Huh? this, uh, This woman in the picture... She's Mrs. Cornelius Hines? That's right. Hmm. Get my shoes. I can't. Do you want me to go out in these bedroom slippers? No, but Wally said... I I can't do it, Uncle Ah, I see. I have no choice then, Charlotte. I bid you a fond adieu. Where are you going? To pay a call on Mrs. Hines. Charlotte... Oh, Charlotte. I'm in the living room. Oh, well, get out the bottle, baby. What happened? I talked to Mrs. Hines this morning, and she told me the cards were almost sold out. Oh, honey, that's wonderful. Uh, Where's Uncle Ed? Well... Uh, Call him in. We'll all have a drink. He's not here, Wally. But I told you not to let him go out that door. I couldn't stop him. If he went out and got drunk again in broad daylight, I'll break him. He didn't go out to get drunk. He went out to see Mrs. Hines. What? He saw her picture, and he went to see her. Let me get that phone. If he does anything to spoil this deal, I'll murder him. I worked for a week on this dame, and I finally got around... Oh, uh, hello. Hello, please connect me with Mrs. Hines' apartment. Thank you. I finally got her on the hook. Hello, may I speak with Mrs. Hines, please? Hmm? Oh, it's you. Well, let me talk to Mrs. Hines. I want to tell her... Hmm? Who? Up. Your uncle. He done it again. What do you mean? Mrs. Hines ain't Mrs. Hines. Huh? She's an old friend of his. But she's a society lady. She's a larceny dame called Society Mary. And she and your uncle are using our football money for a honeymoon. <laughs> We will return to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI in just a minute. Now a brief case from the official files of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, showing how equitable business insurance helps stabilize our American economic system. Names used are fictitious, but the case is an actual one. 
This was the problem that confronted Mr. James Shanahan, president of a large contracting company in Texas. When those two boys of mine came out of the army, they signed up to work for the old man. And they've really taken hold. As far as I can see, there's only one cloud on my horizon. What's that, Mr. Shanahan? Well, those two boys of mine have really pitched in. But they've still got a lot to learn. Can't expect them to pick up any 30-year know-how in three years. Now, uh, say I get killed in an accident tomorrow. What happens to my business? Mr. Shanahan, every day, trained representatives of the Equitable Life Assurance Society are helping business executives solve problems similar to yours. Well, I'd really be interested in hearing a sound and practical suggestion. Well, it might be something like this. The Equitable Society business insurance specialist would probably recommend a substantial amount of insurance on your life, payable to your company. This sum would make it worthwhile for key employees whom you trust to stay with your son. Or it might be used to hire a first-class man from the outside. Strikes me as a step in the right direction. How can I get the whole story? An equitable society business insurance specialist will be glad to sit down with you and your associates and discuss business insurance. He's fully qualified to work out a plan that's tailor-made for your business. Have your secretary call the nearest equitable office and ask for the manager. Or dictate a brief note to the home office of the Equitable Society in New York City. That's E-Q-U-I... T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Gridiron Swindle. In one form or another, the axiom that truth crushed to earth shall rise again, as existed almost as long as man himself. Unfortunately, the same thing might be said about falsehoods. And as the, we trust, late Adolf Hitler proved, falsehoods repeated often enough soon begin to be accepted as facts. One of those untruths that has always permeated our everyday speech is the fallacy which says that there is loyalty among thieves. As you have seen in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, that is a simple and unadorned lie. Criminals, and especially those who are confidence men, live their very lives using deceit and treachery as their everyday accomplices. To expect them to possess in abundance a quality which goes hand in hand with decency is as illogical as to expect a one-month-old baby to stand up when the national anthem is played. If criminals have a single common quality, that quality is not loyalty, but greed. Greed which fuels their everlasting search of something for nothing. Tonight's file continues at the FBI field office. Billings and Garvey have done it again, George. What do you mean, Jim? I've just been over talking to a girl named Bettina Franklin. She called the local police first, and they told her to call us. What about? Well, Billings gave a Mrs. Cornelius Hyen some football pool cards. You know the kind where you get odds for picking a certain number of winners? Yes, I've seen them. Well, Miss Franklin said that Miss Hines arranged for her and 50 other girls to sell the cards throughout the city. Mm. They sold quite a few of them. And every one of the cards was a winner. How could that happen? Well, here's one of them. Take a look for yourself and see. Okay. Anybody could pick winners. You've got Notre Dame, a 20-point underdog. That's right. Same thing with Michigan. And from what Miss Franklin says, Mrs. Hines has disappeared. You suppose she was in on this swindle? I don't know, George. I called the Daily Mirror. They're sending a messenger over with a picture of Mrs. Hines. Oh. In the meantime, I've sent one of the leftover cards to the lab. As soon as we get a report from them, let's try and find out where these cards were printed. <laughs> Yes, Edward. I can't tell you how happy I am. I'm so glad. Ah, fate is a merry prankster. To think that just this morning I was a veritable prisoner. And now I'm speeding across the country, cozily confined with my radiant bride. Oh, that's a little flowery, dearest, but keep on talking. I love it. Ah, oh, Mary, my dove. 
Do you realize how many times in the past we almost got married? It ran into the dozens, didn't it? Uh, it was the most frustrating, I can tell you that. Every time I would be in a position to plead for your hand, you were either married to someone else or confined to the Bastille. Uh, darling, a couple of times you were legally detained yourself. Remember? Ah, uh, too true. Ah, uh, it'll be fun being in California. I've never been out there before, you know. I was there. My first husband took me there on our honeymoon. Oh, I wish you'd told me that before, my dear. I'd have taken you elsewhere. Why? Oh, because you'll have memories. What memories? They arrested him as we pulled into the station, and I went on the honeymoon alone. Oh, hmm. Well, I trust no such vulgar occurrence will interrupt us. Uh, let's drink a toast, my dear. To what? To my niece and her husband for being nice enough to pay for our honeymoon. <laughs> yet from the lab on those football cards, Jim? Oh, I'm just reading the report now, George. What do they say? Well, they sent us these two lists. What are they? Well, the cards were printed on stock manufactured by the Charleston Paper Company. Uh -huh. This is a list of every print shop in this area that buys from the Charleston Paper Company. What's the other list? Well, the uh, lab also identified the type used on the card. It was manufactured by the National Type Founders Incorporated. Uh -huh. Now, the second list carries the name of every print shop in this area that uses national type. I see. Well, all we've got to do now is cross-index these two lists. That'll give us a list of the print shops that carry both Charleston paper and national type. Uh -huh. Then we'll split that list and start checking to see which one of the shops printed these cards. Hello, Wally. Don't hello me. What's the matter now? If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be in this jackpot. What did I... I wanted to throw your uncle out five years ago. But he's not going to get away with this one. You can bet on that. He's not? No. What your dear uncle doesn't know is that I know where he's headed for. Huh? I went over to Mrs. Hines' apartment and told the superintendent I was her brother. And he told you where they went? No, but he let me into her apartment. I ransacked the joint until I found what I wanted. What was that? This piece of paper. What is it? It's a copy of a telegram your Uncle Ed sent to the Hotel Central in Los Angeles. What for? To reserve the honeymoon suite. Where did you find that? In the waste paper basket. Then maybe he didn't send it. He sent it. I checked. How? I called the Hotel Central. You called Los Angeles? Yeah. And they got reservations for Colonel and Mrs. Edward Garvey. So we're flying out there. I never knew Uncle Ed was a colonel. Don't you remember? He appointed himself the week he was being Assistant Secretary of War. <laughs> Sorry I'm late, Jim. That's all right, George. I just got here myself. Mrs. Hines lives in the penthouse of this building. I'm hoping we can find some clue. And she was mixed up in it. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe it'll be better if I give you all this in sequence, huh? Okay. I just learned that Mrs. Cornelius Hines has quite a criminal record. Uh-huh. She came to town about three months ago, posing as the widow of a Texas oil man. She wormed her way into so-called society by throwing a couple of lavish parties. Apparently, she was using the build-up for larceny purposes. Sounds that way. Did you get anything else? Yes, when I finished collecting information on her, I went out to check on my list of print shops. Uh -huh. The fourth place I went to turned out to be the one that printed the cards for Billings. They gave me his address. I went there, but I just missed Billings and his wife. Too bad. Oh, I had a search warrant, though. I went up, looked through the apartment. Mm -hmm. I found a clipping of a picture showing Mrs. Hines selling the first football card to the mayor. The mayor? That's right. I called Mrs. Hines from the Billings apartment. Found out that she'd left early this afternoon. And with a man who answers the description of Ed Garvey. Oh. Come on, let's go inside and see if we can find out where Mrs. Hines and Garvey went. Okay. If we can find them, I've got a hunch we'll get all of them. Well, Mary, this is California. With all this fog, how can you tell? Mm -hmm. oh, I guess that's room service. I'll get it. Colonel. Huh? Out of the way, Uncle. Uh, Mary, we have some guests. Oh, it's Mr. Billings. That's right. Yeah, how did you find us? Never mind that. You know what we're here for. Get up that dough. Edward, he seems quite insistent. You better give Mr. Billings his share. Are you kidding? No. 
You're entitled to half the money. Uh, she's right, Wally. You don't think I'm going to split with you now, do you? That was our original agreement. I made that agreement before you two grabbed the whole thing. Mr. Billings, we were going to mail you your share. Oh, now stop it, will you? You expecting somebody? Uh, it's room service. That's who I thought it was when you came. Okay. Answer the door, but don't talk. All right. Wally. <laughs> What? You never introduced me. Oh, I'm sorry. Mrs. Hines, this is my wife. I couldn't be happier. Uh, Wally, I'm afraid you're not going to get that money now after all. Why not? Sir, you might as well introduce yourself. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Huh? I have warrants here for the arrest of all of you. What? But we're on our honeymoon. Well, the honeymoon's over. Now, you'll please come along with me. Ed, what can we do? Uh, the only thought I have at the moment, my dear, is to seek a co-ed prison. Mr. and Mrs. Billings, along with Edward Garvey and the woman known as Mrs. Hines, were all convicted for violation of the National Stolen Property Act and sentenced to ten years in a federal prison. The clues which led Special Agent Taylor to the Hotel Central in Los Angeles were two in number. The first was that he learned from the apartment house switchboard operator that only one telephone call had been made from the apartment of Mrs. Hines. The charge slip showed that that call had been to Western Union. A check of the Western Union records revealed that Ed Garvey had sent a request for reservations to the Hotel Central in Los Angeles. Special Agent Taylor then flew to Los Angeles with what results you have already witnessed. Like most confidence men and women, the people in tonight's case worked hard to avoid detection. And had the special agents of your FBI been careless or allowed themselves the luxury of getting discouraged, these people might have succeeded in escaping. However, careless investigation plays no part in the work of your FBI. And every special agent is taught as part of his basic training that to become discouraged is fatal. Ninety-nine clues might prove fruitless. But there is always the chance that the next one will be the one that leads to the solution to the arrest and conviction of another segment of America's criminal population. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now one last word about business insurance. The reason why the Equitable Society emphasizes this type of insurance is very simple. The brains and experience responsible for the success of a business enterprise have a cash value and should therefore be protected by insurance like any other valuable asset. Equitable Society representatives have worked out plans for all types of business from progressive corner stores and successful law partnerships to large organizations with thousands on their payrolls. Plan now to enlist the invaluable help that is yours for the asking from a trained business insurance specialist of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A thrilling factual story of an elusive manhunt. Its subject, murder. Its title, The Man Who Died Twice. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Man Who Died Twice. On This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.